Welcome to this Zoom event. This year, this replaces the usual march and rally that Oxfordshire Peace Campaign has at USAF Crowton. <clears throat> and that marks Keep Space for Peace Week. So this year, we have three wonderful speakers. The first one will be Paul Mobbs from Crowton Watch. The second one will be Bruce Gagman from Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. And the third one will be Ray Street from the Rochdale and Littleborough Peace Group. Very good speakers, all of them. I hope you'll be sit tight and watch this. And we'll end with some music and songs from the Sea Green Singers. Thank you. And the first speaker will be Paul Mobbs. He has got a video. He's an independent environmentalist consultant. He's an investigator, an author, and a lecturer, and he runs Crowton Watch. His video is going to show how Britain is to become part of a global network that will allow the US to dominate space. It will be in three parts. The first part will be on space debris. The second part will be on dark, the deep space advanced radar concept, which would in probably involve us here in Britain, and war fighting in space. Thank you. The new Air Force Space Operations Directorate has achieved operating capability. This is one of several key initiatives the Air Force is pursuing to adapt its operations, processes and organizational structure to reflect the reality that space is a war fighting domain. Space superiority, like air superiority, is not an American birthright. It requires vigilance and action and ensure we gain and maintain air and space superiority. America is gearing up to fight a war in space. They want to dominate space to ensure their dominance of the Earth below. That is the core of their strategy, repeated in official documents, congressional testimony, and the internal newscasts from members of the US military. In July 2021, I saw some news articles that made me look more closely at this story. The US military wanted a large site for a radome installation, a kilometre across, either in Scotland or southern England. The reason why I was interested is that a site which fitted up description, USAF Barford St John, is just a short distance from where I live. This is a complicated issue. To explain it as clearly as possible, I will have to break it down into three parts. Space debris, dark, and war fighting in space. Then I will tie the issue all together in the conclusion. Part 1. Space debris. Space is big, really big. However, humans only use an infinitesimal part of it, the area immediately above our heads. Therein lies the problem. This is the key to the ecological issue of space debris. Unwanted junk orbiting the Earth which serves no purpose, in dangers of a satellite, but which we are unable to remove. Like the hubris behind the nuclear waste problem, satellites were launched in the 1950s without any concern about disposal. Today that failure has the potential to deny all of humanity access to space in the future. The further out they are, the more slowly a satellite moves relative to the Earth's surface. That means certain altitudes favour certain satellite applications. These different altitudes are classified into various orbits according to these uses. Low Earth orbit is from the atmosphere up to about 1200 miles above the surface. The lower limit is about 200 miles, below which satellites begin to drag on the atmosphere and slow down. 
Most satellites are somewhere from 400 to 1100 miles up, orbiting about every 90 minutes. Most satellites have been launched into low Earth orbit, so it is the most overcrowded. This is also the area for manned spaceflight. More important than manned flight, low Earth orbit is the domain of Earth observation satellites, which are critical to everything from weather forecasting, to climate change research, to detecting pollution or mapping habitats around the world. Medium Earth orbit extends from 1200 to 22,000 miles above the surface. The main use for this area are slower moving satellites, such as global positioning systems, many of which orbit around 12,600 miles up. Geosynchronous Earth orbit is on the boundary between the high and medium orbits, 22,236 miles up. Here, a satellite moves at relatively the same speed as the ground below, meaning from Earth it appears as a fixed point in the sky. Most orbit near the equator to give a large footprint across the Earth's inhabited regions and are mainly used for communications and broadcast TV. According to the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs, up until April 2021, 11,139 objects had been launched into space. Of those, 7,389 were still up there, half of them no longer working. What's more significant is that a third of those launches took place in the last five years. The first satellite, and the first put into low Earth orbit, was Sputnik 1 on the 4th of October 1957. It broadcast for three weeks, ran out of power, and fell back to Earth two months later, in January 1958. The first satellite in geosynchronous orbit was SYNCOM-3, launched in August 1964. It operated until 1969 when it was switched off, and it is still there. It occupies a small part of the geosynchronous orbit, and will continue to do so for many years into the future unless it is physically removed. The US Space Surveillance Network brings together different elements of civilian and military space observatories to map and catalogue space debris. It also shares data with other bodies working on the issue, like the United Nations and the European Space Agency. This is the source of much of the public data on space debris. The US military's main tracking capability, adapted from ballistic missile warning systems, is based at six sites around the world, such as Filingdales in England. It uses radar to track objects as small as 10 centimetres in diameter in low orbit and around one metre in diameter in geostationary orbit. Currently, the Space Surveillance Network is tracking over 20,000 objects or pieces of space debris larger than 10 centimetres. The Space Surveillance Network also uses NASA's Orbital Debris Program sites to detect smaller pieces of debris down to a few millimetres. These systems are currently monitoring another 900,000 pieces of space debris between 1 and 10 centimetres in size. At present, whole satellites are only a small part of this cloud of debris. There are also spent rockets and pieces that broke off satellites or were dropped by astronauts. There are estimated to be 129 million objects bigger than 1 millimetre. A millimetre may sound insignificant, but a speck of metal moving at tens of thousands of miles per hour has the energy of a bullet. At 10 centimetres, it has the energy of a large bomb. The first recorded case of a satellite being hit by a known piece of space debris was in 1995. In the worst case, one satellite may accidentally crash into another. This happened for the first time in 2009. According to the European Space Agency's data, a fifth of satellite failures happened for no apparent reason. This is most likely the result of being hit by unseen pieces of space debris. That 2009 satellite collision generated over 2,000 fragments larger than 10 centimetres. The risk is that one of those will hit another satellite and create more debris, which might hit another, and then another. The worst case scenario is that there will be a cascade effect, like a chain reaction, destroying most of the satellites in that orbit. This is called the Kessler syndrome, after the scientist who first calculated its probability in 1978. The probability of cascade is related to the density of satellites. The more satellites, the higher the risk, as there are more satellites to sustain the cascade effect. Today's satellite launches are rising exponentially, driven by new commercial satellite constellations in low Earth orbit, such as Elon Musk's Starlink project, with around 1,600 of the planned 42,000 satellites having been launched since February 2018. Other large constellations are planned too, by OneWeb, around 900 satellites, Boeing, around 1,600 satellites, and Amazon, around 3,200 satellites. What is required to initiate Cascade is a large fragmenting event, like a satellite collision, 
or a satellite being destroyed by the military. Once initiated, it cannot be stopped, and could be a barrier to getting into space for a number of decades, until most of the debris has cleared by falling back to Earth. Part 2. The Deep Space Advanced Radar Concept, or DARK. In 2016, the US Air Force's Budget Research Appropriations listed a new project, DARK, the Deep Space Advanced Radar Concept. 10 million was allocated in the 2017 budget, and 30 to 40 million each year from 2018 to 2021. Successive budget appropriation reports describe DARK as follows. DARK will leverage ongoing defense science and technology efforts to mature radar concepts and technologies to develop and evaluate prototypes that demonstrate increased sensitivity, capacity, search rates, and scalability to detect, track, and maintain custody of objects in deep space orbit. The current and future space domain demands that space systems be responsive to new and changing threats, and can rapidly integrate new capabilities to make our warfighting force more resilient in a contested battle space, and ensure our space mission force is ready to defeat a thinking adversary in a complex, multi-domain battle space. This implies that DARK is not a passive system for space debris tracking. It is an active part of an unstated space weapons program. The draft budget for 2022, produced in May 2021, lists an appropriation for 2022 of $123 million. U.S. Space Force is now shifting into the deployment of DARK at the first site in the USA, to be contracted and assessed in 2022 for construction in 2023. The current budget draft also notes, The Space Force intends to develop and field two additional DARK sites in the future to culminate in a final operational system of three global sites to ensure SDA coverage. A strategy based on the success of the Site 1 rapid prototype will be developed later for Sites 2 and 3. It appears Site 2 is planned for Scotland or Southern England, and Site 3 is in Australia. The dark system uses four to six parabolic dish antennas, or ray domes, to send signals into space. The signals bounce off objects and are received on the ground by 10 to 15 dish antennas. To improve signal reception, the receiving antennas need to be spread out over a wide area. The figure suggested is an area one kilometre in diameter. The current budget does not list the figures for Sites 2 and 3, though earlier budgets did. The schedule described in the budget indicates the UK-based dark site could commence construction in early 2024, to be completed and operational by 2026. Site 3 will be constructed over 2025 to 2026. Of course, having the ultimate telescope to see objects in space cannot of itself protect or create security from the military's use of space. And while the dark plan calls for making our warfighting force more resilient in a contested battle space, what is not stated anywhere is how this passive role of looking at space debris can do this. Part 3. Warfighting in Space In mid-July 2021, the media dribbled out stories about DARK, following the visit of UK Defence Secretary Ben Wallace to the US Space and Missile Systems Centre. Picking these stories apart not only highlights the way Ben Wallace's visit was misreported, but also highlights the way in which threats in space are misrepresented to the public by politicians and the military. The BBC News item said, Now the US military wants to build a large new radar site in Britain to track targets in deep space. It comes amid growing concerns about a space arms race. The US and Britain have accused China and Russia of developing weapons to shoot down satellites. The US Space Force is developing a global radar system to identify potential threats up to 22,000 miles in space, as well as the UK. Other sites will include Texas and Australia. Then they interviewed Defence Secretary Ben Wallace. Space is a growing domain for both commerce, but also uh, to protect all the key national infrastructure that we need to in today's world. It, it is under threat in some areas. Our adversaries are weaponizing space, and so we have to make sure at the very least we're providing resilience. The correspondent concluded... It may prove controversial, but the government's made clear it wants Britain to be in the vanguard of efforts to keep space safe. To make sense of that, it is first necessary to know the history of space weapons and their use. 
Russia experimented with anti-ballistic missile and anti-satellite systems from the 1960s. The project was abandoned in 1983. The first country to develop and test a successful anti-satellite weapon against a real satellite was the USA. On the 13th of September 1985, an F-35 jet fired an ASM-135 anti-satellite weapon from an altitude of just over 7 miles. The missile destroyed a NASA satellite, the Sol Wind Solar Observatory, in low Earth orbit around 330 miles up. After the destruction of the Sol Wind satellite, 267 fragments were tracked, some pushed into an orbit 300 miles higher than the satellite. Due to this relatively high orbit, the debris cloud created by the destruction of the satellite continued to orbit for another 20 years. A year later, in September 1988, the US tested another space weapons system, colliding two satellites together in low Earth orbit as part of its Star Wars program. Due to the concern about the amount of space debris created by the previous test, this test took place close to the atmosphere to reduce the spread of debris. China tested an anti-satellite weapon against one of its large weather satellites on the 11th of January 2007. To date, this was the largest ever single fragmentation event, generating over 3,000 pieces of debris. A year later, in February 2008, in Operation Burnt Frost, the US shot down a malfunctioning spy satellite with an anti-satellite weapon, launched from the USS Lake Erie in the Pacific Ocean. As it was nearing re-entry, most of the debris fell back to Earth. Russia did not successfully launch an anti-satellite weapons system, the A-235 Nudol, until 2015. What's curious is that in these stories about space weapons and threats, the country they leave off the list is India, who tested its own anti-satellite weapon, codenamed Mission Shakti, in March 2019. This generated over 100 fragments, but it was near to the atmosphere to reduce debris. Sky News also covered Ben Wallace's visit though it was even less informative. They interviewed Air Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston. I would say that we need to prepare for the potential to defend our critical infrastructure in space. Right now there are countries like Russia and China that are doing things, developing systems that are a threat to satellites. The Sky News report continued. To help counter the threat, the US is planning to build three radar bases that can probe deep space. They'll be able to detect objects as small as a football up to 36,000 kilometers away. Britain says it's focusing on how to defend against space weapons, not build any of its own. But space is viewed as a warfighting domain. They also interviewed Ben Wallace, who said, I don't think there would be a standalone war in space and it wouldn't be like Star Wars and you know, Moonraker with lasers firing all over the place. I suspect in a major conflict, space assets would be targeted. So we have to now invest and prepare today to make sure we have alternatives. Of course, how do we defend our critical infrastructure with a system which only watches? Again, as with Dark, that part of the problem seems to be omitted from the discussion. What was not stated in those news items, but which was revealed by the Express in February 2021, was that British pilots are training to use American anti-satellite weapons on British aircraft. Pilots have been selected for training missions aimed at combating Chinese and Russian military and communication satellites in times of war. Simulated exercises are set to get underway before flying training exercises take place. Training flights without missiles would see Typhoon pilots fly to 40,000 feet before embarking on a 20,000 feet vertical climb. During a real-life attack they would target enemy satellites and release anti-satellite missiles at 60,000 feet before returning. Currently the USA has the most advanced anti-satellite system. If any of those systems were ever used in the most congested part of low Earth orbit, at a time when even more satellites are being crammed into this space, it risks initiating a cascade event. Put simply, their space security system actually endangers the use of space by everyone should it ever be put into action. That is not the situation which was conveyed by the media in July 2021. What is clear from Ben Wallace's US visit is that the British government is in an advanced state of planning to deploy American anti-satellite weapon systems for use by the British military using Britain as one of the major operational hubs to run this global system. Forgive the pun, but we are being deliberately kept in the dark 
about the facts of these systems and their safety. Conclusion. No final frontier for the military. Space represents one of the last truly global commons. The 1967 Outer Space Treaty prevents states laying claim to space, albeit that has not stopped certain states trying to roll back those restrictions for certain commercial activities. The problem with the treaty is that, created in the early years of the space race, it is vague and out of date. In particular, while it prevents weapons of mass destruction in space, the wording of that is vague in the context of today's weapons systems. In 2002, Russia and China jointly submitted a proposal for a treaty to prevent the deployment of weapons in outer space and the threat or use of force against outer space objects. An updated treaty was submitted by Russia and China in 2008, and a third in 2014. In 2017, following a review by the General Assembly, a proposal was made to ban an arms race in space. The first step was to convene a group of experts to review the existing treaty framework and make recommendations to update and extend that system to other space weapons. In October 2017, the USA, backed by the UK, opposed this and it was defeated. Therefore, Ben Wallace, in stating the threat to space that China and Russia represented, without acknowledging the previous history of space militarization and UN negotiations, was deliberately misleading the public as to past events relating to these issues, and deflecting any discussion about the USA and UK's opposition to a UN process that will prevent the threats he was talking about. Therein lies the contradiction which must prohibit the militarization of space. The military of any state cannot be allowed to have dominance in space, since any action to create security could lead to an escalating cascade that would deny access to all. And due to the high risk, even the single use of an anti-satellite weapon could lead to widespread destruction targeting civilian and non-combatants, which is the very definition of a weapon of mass destruction. Any system which is essential in the preparation, launching and the guidance of such weapons, such as a deep space advanced radar concept, must be considered equally reprehensible to the weapon itself. Well, that's um, very good work from Paul. I think it'll take a bit of time to absorb that. It would be good to get that uh, publication so that we can do that. And there's a lot to think about there. The next speaker is Bruce Gagman. Bruce is the coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Our small group, Oxfordshire Peace Campaign, is part of that. Uh, and we celebrate Mark, if you like, Kate Space of Peace Week each week under that umbrella. Bruce will have a PowerPoint presentation and I'm sure will give us a strategic view of the militarization of space and, and associated things. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you all very much for inviting me. Um, I want to also say thank you very much for hosting the Global Network meeting, annual meeting in 2018, when we went to Crowton. Uh, it was a really a wonderful experience for all of us to be there with all of you. Uh, it, uh, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, I've just come from this morning, a protest at Bath Ironworks here in Maine, uh, owned by General Dynamics, where they build Navy destroyers, Aegis destroyers. Uh, they were having a christening ceremony for another new warship. They're working on six new destroyers there at the present moment. And uh, it's the same kind of destroyer that uh, in Paul's good video, he just showed a US 
uh, anti-satellite test in 2008 called Burnt Frost, where the Navy Aegis destroyer launched an interceptor missile and went up and hit a uh, an old U.S. satellite, proving that uh, these warships uh, were anti could also be used as anti-satellite weapons. So that's where we were today. There's been a lot of talk recently in the industry press, the aerospace industry media, about uh, fighting a war in space. Many US generals are saying that it's very likely we're going to have a war in space. This is really very crazy talk. Uh, and uh, you, you have to wonder where it comes from. This slogan, here seen on the building of the U.S. Space Command uh, headquarters at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado, Master of Space. You have to wonder if it has any connection to Hitler's slogan, Deutschland über alles, Germany over all. You know, at the end of World War II, uh, there was a program called Operation Paperclip that smuggled 1,500 former Nazi operatives into the US, uh, seated the entire military industrial complex with these Nazis. And a hundred of them were Werner von Braun and his rocket team that were building the V1 and V2 rockets. The picture at the top right is inside a mountain tunnel called Middlework, where Jews and gypsies, French resistance fighters, communists, homosexuals, all these various prisoners of war were used to build this rocket operation for the Nazis. And then when they were brought to the US, they were sent first to New Mexico and ultimately to the Redstone Army Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama. Today is called the Pentagon of the South. In the picture top left is Werner von Braun with Major General Walter Dornberger, who was Hitler's liaison to the rocket team. Dornberger also came to the US under Operation Paperclip and became vice president of Bell Aerospace in New York. And in the early 1950s, he testified before the Congress of the United States saying, gentlemen, I didn't come to this country to lose the Third World War. I lost two already. And it was his idea, as he spoke to Congress, about putting orbiting battle stations in space that would allow the US to control the pathway on and off the planet, as well as the Earth below. In 1967, the Outer Space Treaty was created at the UN that, as Paul said in his video, said there were no weapons of, mass, uh, weapons of mass destruction should be permanently stationed in space and that the planetary bodies would be the province of all humankind. But since then, in an annual computer war game still being waged by the Space Command, they've determined that the newest weapons fall outside of the Outer Space Treaty because they're weapons of selective destruction, not weapons of mass destruction. So for example, the X-37 on the left, it's the successor to the shuttle that was retired some years ago, called the military space plane, a super drone that has stayed in orbit for a whole year at a time. And just recently it was uh, reported that this X-37 will be able to carry anywhere between six to eight nuclear weapons on board. It can fly down from orbit, and in fact, in the computer war game, it's the very first weapon that is used as the US launches a first strike attack on Russia and China, flies down from orbit, drops the attack, and then goes back up again. On the right is the latest weapon that the Space Command is saying they're gonna be uh, using to neutralize other countries' satellites, basically an electromagnetic laser beam fired into space from the ground, it's now being tested in New Mexico at Kirtland Air Force Base uh, that would be able to disable other countries' satellites. Well, since 1984, actually every year since 1984, 
Russia and China have entered, introduced a treaty to ban weapons in space. It's called PEROS, Prevention of an Arms Race in Outer Space. The idea is let's close the barn, the door to the barn before the horse gets out. The US and Israel have been blocking it. Sometimes other countries join in as well. But clearly the United States has an interest in ensuring that a arms race continues because it's huge profits for the weapons industry. And the United States carries this insane thought that somehow it's going to be able to be the master of space. In addition to all of these other things going on now that are hypersonics, hypersonic weapons that uh, have uh, major, major speeds and maneuverability are not able to be intercepted by so-called missile defense systems. Uh, Russia, China, and the US are all working on them now. But the most frightening thing about hypersonic weapons is because of their speed that you can't really allow humans to make decisions anymore as to whether or not to respond when you see these weapons coming forward. You don't know whether they're nuclear or conventional warheads on board, and you really have to allow the computers or AI to make the decision about how to respond to hypersonic weapons. So the, this, the time is right for a ban on weapons in space, and only by pressure from all of us, uh, putting it on the agenda of our movements, can we uh, make it happen. It's one thing to talk about getting rid of nuclear weapons, but I can promise you that Russia and China have been saying for 10 years or more that we'd like to get rid of our nuclear weapons, but we can't afford to because the United States is encircling us with these so-called missile defense systems. And their job is to be the shield to take out uh, our retaliatory responses after a US first strike attack. So it's not in our interest to reduce our nuclear stockpile at this time. So again, uh, those of us that want to see an end to nuclear weapons, we've got to see that missile defense, hypersonics, the lack of a treaty on weapons in space is absolutely killing any hopes for uh, getting rid of nuclear weapons. At the same time, the US is doing this major pivot into the Asia Pacific, increasing its bases uh, throughout the region, uh, building more airfields for its bombers, building more ports of call for the Navy, and building more barracks for the Marines and other uh, troops. So clearly the United States uh, views China and Russia in that region as its enemy, and it's going after them with a vengeance. At the same time, the nuclear industry views space as a new market. And that's a really important reason why in the name of the global network, we have nuclear power in that name. Right now, NASA is preparing to begin testing the nuclear rocket with nuclear reactors for engines in order to get to Mars in half the amount of time that it takes with conventional rockets. They wanna test these just over our heads in lower earth orbit. The very place where Nigel very effectively in his video showed is becoming massively congested with all of these launches. So to put nuclear reactors up there at this time in a very already congested environment that is gonna be increasingly congested is pure insanity. So another issue that we have to be talking about as well. At the same time, the nuclear industry wants uh, to have nuclear mining colonies on the Mars, on the moon, on various planetary bodies, asteroids, et cetera, so they, they can mine the sky for untold riches. They say there is magnesium and cobalt and uranium on Mars. There's helium-3 and water on the moon. There's gold on the asteroids. But the Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Treaty at the UN, again, said, 
nobody can claim ownership of these planetary bodies. They're the province of all humankind. But when Obama was president in 2015, he signed a new law giving American corporations and rich fat cats authorization to go out and make claims on these planetary bodies, basically uh, declaring America's opposition to the Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Treaty. And so now we see a gold rush underway. And we see again, these rich fat cats who don't pay taxes, who get subsidies and now increasingly are getting contracts. Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, they're getting contracts from the new uh, newly formed Space Force to, to launch military satellites. So they're looking at a real bonanza and making profit in space. At the same time, we've heard everything from 50,000 to 80,000 mini satellites are gonna be launched in the coming years. And come to find out this 5G, as you know, these satellites are being launched for 5G. They say they wanna have a 5G satellite over the head of every single human being on the planet Earth 24 seven. You realize that's an enormous amount of satellites, but these 5G also have major, major military application. Because of the increased speeds under 5G, they're going to be useful for surveillance of all of us and ultimately reconnaissance and targeting, particularly targeting to increase the ability to hit targets on the earth below with drones and other weapon systems. So uh, very few people are talking about 5G and when they do, they hardly ever talk about the military applications. So when we see these satellite launches that are going forward for 5G, we've got to be talking about the implications for increased capability for the military in space. At the same time, you probably have heard that astronomers are deeply angry about all of these satellites that are being launched because they're destroying the night sky, the dark sky, and astronomers are finding it increasingly difficult to be able to do their scientific work. One more thing about all these launches is every time you launch a rocket, there are toxic exhausts that go up and eat away at the Earth's ozone layer. And so again, we have another reason to make a connection to our opposition to these launches, and that's that it's increasing, it's exacerbating the impacts of climate crisis. These launches destroy the environment. For example, you know, I lived in Florida for 30 years, just an hour away from the Space Center, and every time they launch a rocket from the Kennedy Space Center, as the pollution filters back down to the ground, they had a big, they have a big uh, environmental area there around the launch area, a nature preserve, they called it. But when this toxicity would fall into the water, the fish would die, the birds that eat the fish, they would die. And so all of this rocket pollution is highly toxic and highly dangerous. And again, we should all be talking more about that. <clears throat> Lately, we've seen just a literal explosion as everybody wants to have a spaceport in their community. I know it's being talked about in the UK, up in Scotland, parts of England. A uh, picture on the left is from New Zealand where Rocket Lab has been created. On the right, we see Alaska, Kodiak Island, Alaska, where uh, a uh, launch facility was created years ago. They're being built and proposed all over the planet. But these two, I think, are highly important because they're highly instructive. In both cases, Kodiak Island, Alaska, and Rocket Lab 
the local people were promised that it would only be a launch facility for civilian launches. But in the case of Kodiak Island, Alaska, they've all been military. And in fact, even Israel launched their Iron Dome missile defense tests from Kodiak Island. And now India is saying they're gonna do testing from Kodiak Island, Alaska. And then on the left side at Rocket Lab in New Zealand, they were promised it would be civilian, but uh, now Lockheed Martin has taken ownership and control of Rocket Lab and all of their launches are now military launches. I'm just raising a question here. I'm, I'm wondering out loud, when you build these spaceports all over the world, Papua, New Guinea, New Zealand, Alaska, Michigan, uh, Florida, they even want one in Maine, they want one in Hawaii, Scotland, England, and, 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 and ton of other places. Is it possible that at some point in time, these launch facilities could be used when the United States decides it wants to launch a first strike attack on Russia or China? something that they war game all the time, something they're clearly preparing for as they create their military architecture. I wanna to go to this slide. I think I skipped over it accidentally. This is a slide by the SDA, the Space Development Agency. It's part of the Space Force. Their job is to basically create all the technologies, the space architecture to make all of this happen. And as you look at this, you see they're talking about various layers, tracking layer, transport layer, battle management, uh, navigation layer, custody layer. I don't know exactly know what all of those things mean, but we're talking about layers upon layers upon layers of military satellites orbiting the earth that would be used for first strike attack. And so it's very clear to me that all of these spaceports then could be used to launch a missile with either a conventional warhead or a nuclear warhead in a US first strike attack against Russia or China or Iran or any other country that they don't like. And they just would overwhelm them with rockets coming from you know, many, many, many different parts of the earth aimed at them. Is that possible? Is it possible that that is in their planning today? One has to wonder. One has to wonder for sure. In 1968, I organized a protest at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, uh, opposing the militarization and weaponization of space. And our speaker that day was a former astronaut Apollo astronaut, Edgar Mitchell, one of the moonwalkers, the only astronaut ever to come and speak at such a protest. And he said something that Paul really outlined very well in his video, that if we ever have a war in space, it will be the one and only, because we will create so much space junk, space debris orbiting the earth, at 15,000 miles an hour, that we will be entombed to the earth below. He said, we will not be able to get a rocket off the earth through that minefield, or as he called it, a piranha laced river. We won't be able to get through it. We will be entombed to the planet. But since that time, something else has become obvious to us, is that when you start having this cascading effect, space debris hitting more satellites, creating more space debris, having war in space, things blowing up. Guess what happens back on Earth? We go dark. Everything we do on this planet today is hooked up to satellites. So it's cell phones, internet banking, ATM machines, GPS, uh, airport, air, airport air traffic control, traffic lights in cities, weather prediction, you name it. Everything we do on this planet virtually is hooked up to satellites. And when they've all been smashing into each other, life back on earth stops. 
And so we have a moral and ethical need today to talk about the heavens in a way we never have before. The greedy corporations and the militarists want to take control of space for their own designs. They want to move the bad seed of war and greed and environmental degradation into the heavens. And we, dear friends, are the ones that are standing in the way. And we have to increase our numbers, increase the connections in our articulation so that we show this greater picture to the public so they begin to understand that war and space being sold to them by our governments is defensive and necessary uh, to protect us. In fact, is just the opposite. It's gonna destroy our lives. It's gonna destroy life on this planet. So I say to you, number one, thank you for your good work. This is the shirt I wore today, free the sky of nukes and weapons at the protest that we had down here at Bath Ironworks, three blocks from where I live. Thank you for your work. You're always the first group in the world to sign up for Keep Space for Peace Week every single year. Thank you for your solidarity, your loyalty, your dedication. What this old black man I knew in Florida called stick to -itiveness. You got <laughs> stick to -itiveness. Thank you. For Thank you for that. Press on, keep going. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Bruce. That was in, in one part, incredibly horrifying to see what is laid out before us by you. I, I, really value that uh, analysis, very, very frightening. But I also really thank you for your advice and encouragement uh, that all is not lost and we have to keep going. And thank you so much for that uplifting end to it all. So that is very satisfying. And it, but it's also a wake up call really to see what is out there, what, what, what faces us really. And so, one of the things I'd like to do now is to just link what you said about nuclear power in space, part of your presentation, and move on to Ray Street, because Ray um, is, is a dedicated peace activist. She's been campaigning for a long time. She's a former vice chair of CND, and she is, I think, probably the chair of the Rochdale and Littleborough Peace Group, affiliated. CND. And she's going to give us an update on nuclear power on the earth. So over to you, Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. And thank you for inviting me. I feel humbled, really, to speak after that. Those wonderful presentations from Paul Mobbs and Bruce Gannion. Um, Bruce Gannion, you've definitely got stickability, but you're so knowledgeable, too. It's, um, it's inspiring and I hope it's inspired everybody to resist war in space. And I'd, I'd hope we'd be able to get some of your t-shirts somehow <laughs> to add to our own CND one. But what I'm going to speak about may seem perhaps not quite so chilling as what Bruce was speaking about, but yet, it has the potential, of course, nuclear energy, and it's part of the weapons in space. So um, it, it is very dangerous. With the current energy crisis, there is much talk of investing in new nuclear, but this will not solve the immediate crisis here as new nuclear reactors would not be in production for years. And in any case, there are a host of reasons why there should not be investments in new nuclear reactors. Indeed, CND strongly opposes nuclear energy as well as nuclear weapons. 
And CND has the backing of many leading scientists. As recently as this week, the Professor in Energy and Climate Change at the University of East Anglia said that there is no longer, no longer a good case for the new 20 billion power plant on the southern coast at Sizewell. He said that the offshore wind <coughs> can produce power more quickly and cheaply and new ways to store wind turbine energy means supplies could be maintained even in low winds. On the question of climate change, the proponents of nuclear power say nuclear energy is vital. That is nonsense. According to Andrew Blood, Emeritus Professor of Social Sciences at the Open University, far from being the solution to the problem of climate change, new nuclear power stations like Sizewell C and Bradwell B on the fragile and vulnerable East Coast are likely to become victims of the inevitable, imminent and irreversible consequences of global warming. He continued, put simply, there is little justification for these huge structures in terms of need. But regardless of need, given the threat that, to the integrity of the sites and the risk to present and future generations and the environment, the proposals should be scrapped forthwith. On the question of jobs, which is always uppermost in the minds of the unions, renewable energy is already providing more jobs than the nuclear energy sector. Dr. Ian Fairley, an independent consultant on radioactivity in the environment, wrote in 2016, the Office for National Statistics, the ONS, data for 2014 indicated only 15,500 direct jobs in nuclear, compared with 43,500 direct jobs in renewables. Recent updates show the disparity increasing. The costs of building and running nuclear power stations are astronomical. This has meant that Toshiba, for example, decided to abandon plans to build a 13 billion power, <coughs> sorry, nuclear power plant project at Moorside in the northwest of the UK. The Japanese company said in a statement, after considering the additional costs entailed in continuing to operate NewGen, Toshiba recognizes that the economically rational decision <coughs> is to withdraw from the project. Toshiba, which will take a 164 million hit to cancel Moorside and had already spent more than $525 million on it, had earlier tried to sell NewGen to South Korea's Kepco, but they wouldn't have it either. It fell apart. There is also the cost, not often mentioned, of decommissioning nuclear sites. The Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, most recent estimate is that it will cost £132 billion pounds to decommission the civil nuclear sites. And the strike price, of course, for nuclear far exceeds that of electricity from offshore wind, which continues to come down in price. No one has yet found a solution to disposing of the radioactive waste produced by nuclear power stations. All that can be organized is safe storage, but where will that be found? A major part of the nuclear waste is held at Sellafield in Cumbria in the northwest, a site containing over a hundred tons of the nuclear <coughs> of the most toxic substance ever created. The government and industry want to bury the waste deep underground, which may explain 
the approval for the opening up of a deep coal mine near the Cumbrian coast. It is certainly difficult to see how this benefits the people of West Cumbria, which is said. The proposed coal mine is being vigorously opposed by people working to combat climate change. Why dig out coal now? With all the difficulties, is it not folly to produce more radioactive waste? Very rarely mentioned are the human costs. Starting with the mining of uranium, the radioactive element which is mined and enriched for nuclear fuel. And of course, this of course overlaps with all the other things we've been talking about today. Through the decades, this has been mined mainly on the land of indigenous peoples across the world, from Australia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, to the land of the Navajo in the United States. The local people have had no alternative but to be miners. In return, the miners and their families have had generations of suffering from cancers, ill health and untimely death, and they live in poverty. Their land is desecrated. This is nuclear colonialism. Accidents can happen. The Chernobyl disaster should have been a wake-up call. A growing body of evidence supports a very grim reality that living in radioactively contaminated areas over multiple years results in harmful health aspects, especially in pregnancy. This has been well documented in Kate Brown's book, Manual for Survival. Kate Brown, who teaches environmental and nuclear history at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, spent a decade meticulously researching and uncovering the real human cost of Chernobyl. It had never been said so plainly. It was all covered up. And you still get people saying, oh, there are only a few deaths at Chernobyl. We need also to think of terrorist attacks. If a suicide bomber were to attack an array of solar panels or wind structures, it might present difficulties or with the electricity supply going down. But that would be nothing to compare to an attack on a nuclear reactor, which would spread radioactivity for miles, the equivalent of a nuclear warhead exploding. And it's no good saying that they're defended by police, etc., and saying it couldn't happen. Look at the attack on New York. Um, so, well, we've just been celebrating, not celebrating, rather commemorating the anniversary of that. Small modular reactors, because they are small, still come with problems. They could still be attacked. There could still be accidents and they do produce radioactive waste. If you would like to read more about this in greater detail, Dr. Ian Fairley and Pete Roche have just written a six page document on the SMRs and so-called advanced nuclear reactors, showing clearly that they will not tackle climate change. Finally, and this is of great import to all of us, of deep concern is the connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Recent research by two academics, Professor Andy Sterling and research fellow Dr. Phil Johnson of the University of Sussex have shown the interdependence of the civil and the military. Nuclear weapons manufacture needs the skills and the resource of civil nuclear power. 
So the push for a new nuclear bill from the industry and politicians is undoubtedly linked to the maintenance of nuclear weapons, which under the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW, are now illegal under international law. There is no case for nuclear power. It is, as one academic said, an obsolete and dangerous technology. Thank you all, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Ray. That was another wake up call. This long standing nuclear issue has been with us before nuclear weapons, but it's obviously this interlink that you mentioned, the push by uh, industry and government for more nuclear weapon power, sorry. And it is such a thing we have to really keep uh, uh, allied to our work on nuclear weapons. Um, and thank you so much for putting that like that because it just gives us uh, a, 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 a way to put it all together and see how everything is linked from space to the ground. We all have to campaign on all of it. And thank you so much for that. I'd like now to just ask Rob whether he would um, play the uh, Sea Green Singers video. This is a group of singers who sing freedom and green songs, and they sing at events supporting peace and social justice around Oxfordshire. These are the Sea Green Singers. And so this is a video that they prepared for this particular event. We are the Oxford Sea Green Singers, and we're still singing, singing for our lives. We are the Oxford Sea Green Singers, and we're still singing, singing for our lives. We sung a thousand songs of peace, and we will sing the ten thousand more. For how can we be silenced when the guns still roar? We sung a thousand songs of peace. Command has publicly stated that it intends to control space in order to protect US interests. It is crucial that the movement to stop this new round in the arms race moves quickly ahead. We are all under the stars, and no matter how far we are apart, we are. The 
Pentagon believes that future military success will depend on space capabilities. But there are obstacles to US space dominance. The Outer Space Treaty, which the US has signed, forbids weapons of mass destruction from being deployed in space. We Using current satellite technologies, the US is able to intercept communications from anywhere on Earth and is able to identify and target any supposed enemy that it wishes. Through this control, the US intends to dominate the Earth and beyond. Bombs cannot dissolve hatred, but justice and love can overcome the machines of destruction. Before us today are set life and death. We choose life that we and the world's children may live. We Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the three speakers, uh, Paul Mobs, Bruce Gagnon, and Ray Street for such an amazing presentations that you gave. I think it's given us such a lot to think about. It's brought us all up to date. We realize the magnitude of what goes on day and night. They never speak, and we have to face that. But thank you so much for your encouragement as well. And thank you, Rob, for doing the technical part of this, all of this event. Thank you for everybody who watched and let's go out and face them and take them on. Thank you so much.